and welcome. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another SDF webinar. I'm Katrina Matheson. I'm a professor in substance use and the chair of the Scottish Drugs Death Task Force. And in today's webinar, we are talking about sex, drugs, and risk, and understanding risk behaviours and harms for people involved in chem sex, in transactional sex, or iPad use. So today's webinar ties in with the launch of our research report that myself and colleagues at the Scottish Drugs Forum wrote on understanding these sexual health and bloodborne virus risk behaviours for these at-risk groups. And it's really to inform a service training programme. The at-risk groups where the, the groups the research focused on were those involved in chem sex, transactional sex, and people who use image and performance enhancing drugs. So we will talk about the services and the programmes available to these three groups. And we're going to hear from four speakers today across Scotland um, who work with these particular populations. So our speakers that will be coming up are Emma Thompson, Alistair Rose, Finley Colville and uh, Dr Alison Scott. We'll he hear from each speaker in turn and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. So as the speakers are talking, note down your questions and put them into the question function. So um, let me work from SDF, we'll be joining us at that discussion session at the end and we'll be helping manage those questions and summing up the questions from all of the attendees. So before we go to the main speakers, I'm going to go through a few slides that will give you an overview of the report and the main findings. So, thank you. So this was the, the title, of course, of the seminar, um, the webinar and the report itself. So we can go on to the first slide, please, Sophie. Yeah, so just a brief introduction why we did this research. So there's these three distinct specific groups who are often hidden and well, less well understood, really, in terms of what their particular service needs might be. So I've already mentioned those three groups. Um, they're all distinct and different um, on, on the whole. And really what we wanted from the research was to find out, are there any specific risk-taking behaviours to each of these groups? And what are the information, treatment and support needs of these groups? So if we, next slide, please. I'm going to, for each of the three groups, go run through briefly the risks, and that's the high level risks, and then the information and support needs that we identified. Now, the report has got lots of detail um, and lots of quotes that will give context to this. It's a much more interesting read, but I can, I can only do a few brief um, high-level things just now. So, in terms of transactional sex, the risks, really, there's a broad range of drugs that are used in this group, and polydrug use is particularly common. The large quantities of drugs being used in one, in one go, um, particularly things like street valium, which is a, an ongoing problem we have across Scotland at the moment. Sharing injecting equipment and crack pipes also came out as a risk behaviour, condomless sex, and there was really a lack of awareness in some people in particular around what safe injecting practice is. So next slide, please. So moving on to what we identified as the information and support needs for this group. Participants did know the risks around sharing injecting and, um, and pipes, but often said they'd shared in the past, but um, hadn't shared recently. So you, when you're a researcher, you wonder, you know, there's an element of what we'd call social de desirability bias coming into the responses there. There was often a bit of vagueness around the sexual health checkups or, or smear tests and whether they'd had one and how often. And so I, we think that vagueness was maybe indicative of um, those not being as frequent as might be ideal for their sexual health. What did come out, and is really an important uh, thing for services, is that if somebody does attend for a checkup, it can be indicative of some other factor. And it might be triggered by something like an act of unprotected sex they felt was risky or a traumatic event of some sort. So trauma awareness is really important in such instances. There was definitely low knowledge around the full range of sexually transmitted infections and their symptoms and the long term effects of those. And something that came up was really that there's a need for some advice on how to manage difficult behaviours in others, like in clients. 
um, because people do take advantage of this women in particular and their vulnerabilities. So that's a brief overview of that. If we can move on to the next slide, please. And this is just the risks around chemsex and the uh, group of people we interviewed. These are the drugs that came up. I've just listed them there for your information. The risks taken were very much around condomless sex, which seemed uh, fairly common. Prolonged drug using sessions, so people will be taking drugs over a, a, a weekend and repeating, repeat dosing, um, and you know other aspects of um, their health during that time would be would be probably compromised. Also, there was a specific thing about allowing other people to prepare drugs for them and the lack of dose control. And this is relevant in this group because of some drugs, particularly um, GHB, where it's a liquid and the dosing is very, very uh, precise, should be quite precise, and just a small amount can really uh, throw, throw somebody off. And there's a quote there to explain that. So if we can move on, please, Sophie. So the information and support needs for this group there really is a perception, a difference in the perception of risk between the chemsex community and the staff and services uh, for them, providing services. Sometimes excess risk we felt could be part of a, a self-destructive behaviour um, and maybe linked to shame and stigma. PrEP use could again influence perception of risk and result in lower condom use. People did sometimes also make some what we really consider irrational assumptions that other people don't take risks about sexual um, health and their BBV status, um, and yet you know they themselves would take would take risks um, by not using condoms as an example. Prep is widely used, and um, so people working in in the services really do need to be familiar with the dosing schedules for that. Adherence to PrEP and ARV, antiretroviral uh, medications, um, it can become quite challenging when people are using chem, so there needs to be awareness of that. So moving on to the final group, and if we, if we can get the next slide, so this is the image and performance enhancing drug group. Injecting related injuries were the main kind of risk really, and that occurred because of poor injecting site poor injection sighting and lack of knowledge around that and lack of hygiene. Really very little evidence of needle sharing, which was encouraging, and not much evidence that bloodborne virus or STI risk through condom use or lack of condom use, I should say, was worse than in the general population. So final slide, please, Sophie. So the risks, or sorry, the information needs for this group this group really did seek information. They wanted to know what they were going to take and how, and they wanted to be very well informed. Um, but they often used the internet or friends or gym colleagues to do that as sources of information. And they would rarely go to a service first before they ever started taking drugs. They would seek information from elsewhere. Some did say it'd be helpful to have a kind of independent and trusted site like an NHS website to provide such information. And it came across as well that iPad users aren't averse to being an to answering detailed questions if it's an informed um, and pertinent question from a knowledgeable staff member if they are visiting, for example, um, an IEP facility. So thank you for my slides. I am now going to move on and introduce our first speaker. So the first speaker we've got today, I'm going to welcome Emma Thompson to speak. Emma is a specialist hi. sexual health nurse at Sandford Clinic. Emma, hi. Hi. Um, cool. And Emma, you're talking to us about those um, people involved in transactional sex. So over to you, then, Emma. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, that's the first slide. Thanks, Sophie. Um, so it's been good to look at the research, and I have to say that I definitely get a, a lot of recognition with it and it was interesting to participate in the, um, the group meetings as well um, and so to open with I would say that yeah I definitely agree with the key points identified in the research um, from my experience in working with uh, people involved in transactional sex I would say for certain groups drug use and transactional sex is completely absolutely bound together um, uh, you know and I, I would say that the, for the majority of cases the overwhelming need to obtain drugs 
for the individual overrides any choice or rights that they have around sex and really sort of putting it bluntly that sex for this group becomes something very different than it does for the majority of us it's not pleasant it's not equal it's exploitative and it's often violent so moving on to the next slide and the first key point um, that i've picked up on is drug use in relation to transactional sex so it does make complete sense that taking drugs and alcohol to make it easier to have transactional sex it makes complete sense um, my feelings is that it perhaps numbs the person to the reality of their situation provides a distraction during the act of having to have sex with punters in really awful situations and surroundings um, and moving on so under the same key point of drug use different drugs are taken in different ways at different times so as a sexual health nurse working with this group I'd say my knowledge on drug use and the range of ways they are taken is fairly well informed but I know there's others on here just now that will have expert knowledge on this but what I would say is that my experience of seeing women using different drugs it affects their cognition it affects their decision making it affects their need for money to fund the drugs and that all leads to them being even more vulnerable when having to participate in transactional sex. Um, so the next point under the heading of drug use is women were often introduced to drugs by someone usually with some sort of power over them or someone more experienced in drug use. Um, so I would say that in my experience that females make up the vast majority of vulnerable people involved in transactional sex and this kind of reflects how vulnerable women are viewed by society. Um, their exploitation is by the punter but also often by other males in their lives maybe a, a partner for example um, I've also observed that some young vulnerable women view a partner introducing them to drugs and the rituals of drug taking as being in inverted commas cared for in a very odd way um, it kind of shows a submission to a partner which some women see as desirable to their partner due to their own past experiences um, so trying to address this is a massive undertaking which will require a societal shift over many years which is beyond me but I hope that being aware of it and challenging it as much as we can will make some difference um, so if we can move on to the next slide and the key point relates to trauma and vulnerability so there are two subheadings for this point I've picked up on and they are times of trauma whether due to poor mental health loss of a partner being made homeless and losing benefits are key points for women who use drugs consider involvement in transactional sex um, and then under that is vulnerability in women whether due to being care being in the care system and not having adequate support or having older boyfriends who may have groomed them or boyfriends who use drugs is key to involvement in transactional sex so again i would go to see from my knowledge and experience of working with this group they are disproportionately affected by trauma, adverse childhood experiences right through to trauma in adulthood. Um, so to me, there's this cycle of, for them to consider being involved in transactional sex completely fits with this picture of vulnerability leading to unhealthy relationships with power imbalance, which then leads to exploitation and grooming, which then leads to addiction to cope with trauma and that addiction, meaning the individual having to exchange sex for money or drugs. Um, so moving on to the next si slide if we could which is key findings of sexual health and the first point made there is there's often some vagueness when asked if and when they had had a sexual health checkup indicating attendance for sexual health checks was haphazard so I would say in response to that that that's a, to me an example of poor health literacy and it's common in vulnerable groups who miss out on educational opportunities and health campaigns and that doesn't just relate to sexual health it relates to all health um, but ad addressing that um, I think is about sexual health services and other agencies working together to share knowledge and skills helping educate the people involved in transactional sex and also regarding the people that support them um, information and advice and education for the people that support them so again under the heading of sexual health we've got if someone actually goes for a checkup it's indicative of the potential of other potential factors which Katrina talked about attendance for a sexual health checkup might be triggered by unprotected sex of a traumatic nature thus aware trauma awareness is, is essential for service providers so uh, talking from the perspective of the Sandyford where I work we have a, a sort of minimum set of questions that we ask everyone who attends 
um, and so a routine and routine disclosure questions are asked in a sensitive way. So a couple of examples of them would be: Are you seeing anyone just now? How's that going? Is it a good relationship? Have they ever been nasty or abusive to you? Have you ever experienced abuse from anyone in the past? What about when you were young? Have you ever had to have sex with anyone to get money or drugs? Have you ever been forced to have sex when you didn't want to? And these are the sort of questions that I ask and I expect my colleagues also do the same. Um, but they're key. Those are key, really important questions for people to have the opportunity to disclose traumatic events, recent traumatic events and traumatic events right through from, from when they were children. Um, and I know for myself, um, developing these skills has has come through time and experience, but um, these questioning, difficult probing questions are difficult and challenging for us all, but they make such a difference to, certainly to my practice and how clients interact with me. And I would say it's important for us all to kind of push ourselves into that uncomfortable zone of asking those difficult questions. Um, because people often have never been asked questions, really important questions about major events that define who they are and, the kind of life that they are living at that time. Um, so in addition to that, from a sexual health point of view, getting clear histories from clients is key because otherwise we can't provide them with the right sexual health care um, and also we can't direct them to the right services if they have had any um, sexual trauma or rape or sexual assault. Um, so it's about getting skilled at asking questions and I think sexual health services and as I say other agencies working together can build on that and create healthy questions that, that will probing and important questions that will get us to the point of disclosure of um, a client's needs. Um, okay so the next issue um, under sexual health was women involved in transactional sex may have low knowledge or understanding of the full range of STIs and the symptoms and long and long term effects of those. So it kind of goes back to what I was saying already about us all being able to work together. Um, uh, it shows that education around sexual reproductive health for those involved in transactional, transactional sex and those supporting them is absolutely key. Um, it's hard for those involved in transactional sex independently to have the motivation to have the interest or the capacity to be educated in these issues when they're caught up in cycles of addiction so it's vital that close um that those supporting them and advocating for them have the knowledge and strong links to sexual health services to support them to do that um so the next point was that women involved in transactional sex may be unlikely to attend for regular smear tests which I was particularly pleased to see this issue being singled out in the research. I think it's a demonstration of all screening programmes that vulnerable women miss out on, um, such as bowel screening, mammograms. For, for people to benefit from screening programmes, they need an address to start with, um, for them to be sent out appointments, they need money to travel to appointments, they need routine to be able to stick to appointment dates and times. Um, they need to be able to access a GP or sexual health service to get a smear done. Um, and often I find that women that I've worked with have a feeling of disassociation from their genitals and they want to ignore any requirement for them to be examined due to possibly childhood sexual abuse, rape, and purely for the trauma of having to be involved in transactional sex. Um, breaking down the barriers is complex, it's time consuming, but it can be done if the person has the right access to services, the right support, continuity and time. Um, and I think until it can be provided for all women involved in transactional sex, it will continue to be a real health inequality that leads to serious illness such as cervical cancer and other genital conditions. So the last slide is the key findings on service and information needs. So first point I'm responding to sexual health information testing for STIs, BVDs, condom use and smear tests. All of this can be provided at Sandyford um, and other sexual health services in Scotland, but that's dependent on the client getting to us. Making, to make this happen, we need to have joined up working with agencies that support people involved in transactional sex. And if that happens, we'll all be really busy, but that's good. Um, and the powers above will need to respond to that um, increase in demand. Um, so looking now at um, sources of information and advice, 
we have good services. I'm talking for Sandy Ford here, but we have lots of really good services and a good website that's been developed recently as well, which hopefully will be helpful for um, a service providers and those that support women. Um, almost finished. Continuity of staff is a real challenge for everybody involved in healthcare, I would say, but it is possible in certain clinics, specific clinics that we provide. Um, hopefully, demand for more services will allow more continuity. It's an ongoing challenge and hopefully that can be addressed. For a small group of women in Glasgow at the moment, they do have continuity and I'm really pleased about that. But as I say, it is just this very small specific group. Um, okay, so services open late and have flexibility around appointment times. Again, this has its challenges, mainly resources, but it's possible if organisations are prepared to invest. So that's me finished. Um, so I've stuck to the brief that was to give my take and experience on the key outcomes from the work that I do. So it's anecdotal, it's not evidence-based, but I hope you find it, um, I hope you find the insight and experience that I have of, of value. Thanks. That's great, Emma. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> yeah, getting your personal uh, sort of uh, in your experience and, and input um, insight there is, is really essential um, to complement you know what's found in, in research findings. And so thank you for that. Um, again, just people remember that uh, to know any questions in the questions box as you um, you might want to do that now, just as we switch over to to the next speaker, and Emma will take those questions at the end. So if we move on to our second speaker now, that's Alistair Rose, who is the manager of FX, which works to improve the health, the sex, health and well-being of men who have sex with men. And his focus of his presentation is on chemsex. So this is our chemsex group now. So hi, Alistair. Hi, sorry about that. Um, I, that's I, all right. I, you know, over to you. Actually, so, um, you know, I guess before I sort of start, it was quite interesting listening to the sort of introduction to this and, and the work that um, the SDF have done around this, because understanding the chemsex situation in Scotland is really important. It's really important because often a lot of the stuff we are starting to identify through our work can quite be quite different from what's, to, uh, what's experienced in places like London and Berlin and like that. And I think it's important to remember the consequences of chemsex use as well is really important. You know, we can have huge impacts on people's lives. And when you look at the different uh, geographic situations Scotland finds itself in and the demographics it finds itself in, the outcomes of chemsex behaviour can be very different, resulting in isolation, loss of jobs, loss of housing, loss of family members, loss of social circles. So bear that in mind as I'm going through the presentation. If we move on to the next slide, um, I'll just, basically what I want you to to do is give you a brief, quick understanding of what chemsex is. I could spend this whole afternoon telling you what chemsex is, but it's just going to be a bit, very brief. I want to focus in on why men participate in, in chemsex and the reasons behind that, and then steps we can take to reduce harm and discuss chemsex with our clients. So if we move on to the next slide. So what is chemsex? Well, there's lots of definitions out there about chemsex, and traditionally we've used a definition that's been um, very much focused on the London scene, and that is the use of drugs in a sexualised context. And when we talk about the use of drugs in a sexualised context, we are talking that guys are using drugs for the purposes of the sex they're having, and it's important to bear that in mind, and I'll explain to that why in a minute. As, as the report highlighted, you know, there's sort of three common drugs at play, which is crystal meth, GHB and methadrone. And these drugs are what's commonly used in, in the chemsex scene in Scotland as well. But what we are seeing is increasingly other drugs such as MDMA, ketamine and cocaine. And again, the SDF report highlights that. They're taken in many different ways as well. They can be taken by slamming, which is injecting, snorting, swallowing, booty bumping or through genitals such as urethra as well, as, 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 as we found out in some of our work. And it's important to realise that chemsex happens before, during and after sex, and also to keep on going. And one of the things we know about chemsex is chemsex doesn't usually just last for 20, 30, 40 minutes. It can last for days. It can last for four to five to six days. And how chemsex has happened is because it has happened in the rise of social sexual apps. It's just where gay bisexual men meet each other for sex. And these have sort of been responsible for the enabling of, of chemsex. And it can be in somebody's house, it can be with many partners, it can be on premises. 
And interestingly, in COVID-19, despite the lockdown, we've seen a bit of a new behaviour going on in respect of chemsex, and that's using chems, chems while participating in the sex acts on digital platforms. So if we move to the next slide, I'm going to sort of quickly run through our experience. So what I thought it was to bring some personal experiences into this, and this is a quote from one of our service users we worked with a few years ago. I'm not going to read the quote out to you, but what I'm going to talk about is the things that presents to us when we're talking about and it's about the fact that we still, even internally, have stigma and, 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 and negativity around the sex as gay men that we have. And that can be for a number of factors. It can be because we've experienced lifelong stigma and discrimination, but it also can be because we have other aspects of, of, of life experience as well. So, for example, in Scotland, we see more people talk to us about the impact of religion. And what I really want to pull from, from this quote here is the fact that Kems enable this person to feel free of all the stigma and discrimination, both internally, but also externally. So free from the stigma and discrimination he might experience from his family, but also his internal own stigma. And that is quite prominent amongst guys who come to us and seek support around their chem sex use. And moving on to the next quote on the next slide. Um, again, this sort of talks about um, how we look at chem sex in the world we live in. You know, Guys know when they participate in chemsex, often what they're doing can be quite risky and dangerous. But as gay men, we've, we've lived a life in many cases of where we've had to experience risk and danger in the sex we have. But it's also around so much pressure about who we are, about being gay and about our age and about how we go about the sex we have. And this term slut shaming is where people are shamed in because they have so much sex. And that can be both within the community, amongst our friends, and even when they access services. And then you throw in the guilt around the sort of systemic discrimination we have. It often makes uh, sex feel impossible for people. And what guys always tell us when they're engaging in chemsex is the sex they have on that is quite possibly the best sex they've ever had because the feelings are so powerful and the experiences of being free from the stigma and discrimination is so powerful. So these are two examples from service users that um, sort of highlight why people might engage in chemsex. And on the next slide, I sort of put down, went through all our case notes over the last few years. And again, it talks about what all these things. And I'm going to just point, uh, pull one or two things from there. I've talked about sexual freedom. That's really important. Rejection on the apps is a big reason why guys might do it. So we are constantly rejected on the sex apps. So the, so this, the perception of gay bisexual men is we live a life of where we're quite sex positive. But actually within the gay community, a lot of men experience rejection. We continue to have the sexual shame around who we are, the sex we have. Men often talk about how they're not confident in uh, disclosing things like anal sex to service providers. Um, the stigma around HIV status, for example, the peer pressure, but also things like masculinity. Masculinity in, within the gay scene is as equal, equally um, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of welcomed and not welcomed by certain communities. And people may feel they're not masculine enough if they don't perform a specific se uh, sexual role, for example. And then we look at other negative concepts, which is around things like coercion. A lot of men will report to us is that they feel coerced into, into having chemsex. And then there's a fear of, of disease, a fear of HIV, and a fear of STIs. So chemsex allows them to draw away from that. And, you know, sexual pleasure. And I'll touch, you know, I've already talked on sexual pleasure, but it does provide a lot of guys report to us. It makes them last longer, makes them more horny, and gives them better orgasms. So when we're working with guys, we've got a, quite a complex situation to unpick. And what's really good about this report is it kind of highlights how we are best to engage with guys around that. And if we move on to the next slide again, when we look at reducing harm, and this is what we are really all about is reducing harm. For any of us working with people in, in engaging in chemsex, we have to lose the judgment. We have to lose the judgment on the fact that they're using chems, but we also have to lose the judgment on the types of sex they have, because it takes a lot of courage for people to disclose to us that they're engaging in chemsex, and they very rarely do it through in the first time they engage them. We need to be confident in having open, holistic discussions about chems and the sex that guys are having, including being confident in talking about sexual pleasure and being positive about the right to have pleasurable sex. Understand the issues around body confidence. It's not unusual for a guy in their 30s and 40s to feel rejected because of their age, and perhaps they maybe start to put a bit later on in life, later on in life. And again, be confident, build a conversation around intimacy and the importance of intimacy. 
some people tell us that, that in, in talking to guys around chemtex, we're afraid to talk about safer consumption. My view is we take a, a harm reduction approach. We cannot always say that abstinence well, is possible. And in many cases we work with, we, we don't, you know, we don't work towards an abstinence goal because it's just not possible. But what we do is we set achie achievable goals and that is done so holistically. So that is not just looking into the, their sex lives and not just focusing on what they do in terms of our sex, but it's actually looking at our life, life overhaul. So we will have conversations with guys and say, when did you last go out for a nice meal with someone and actually do some dating and even some flirting with other people. And if we move on to the next slide again, What's important is when we discuss chems with our clients. Um, many men will, as I said, not initially admit to using chems and engaging in chem sex. And most guys who do uh, participate in chem sex would not necessarily see it as a drug use problem. They see it as very much relating to the sex they're having. I think what's really important if you do discuss um, chem sex with people, it's nearly always happened because of a major life impact issue, such as sexual assault, um, loss of job, loss of family, these kind of things often bring people to want to make a step to feel they need to change. And always operate within the scope of competence. Don't think if you're getting somebody who's presenting with chemsex and you turn up at your service that you can fix them. It might be a very complex need. You may need to bring in you know, professional resources. You may have to bring in other third sector organisations and even other, or, even other uh, statutory sector providers. Confidentiality is very important. And when we first started looking at chemsex in Scotland, it was very difficult when we all started talking about to look at how we could maintain the confidentiality of our service users when we're talking because we thought there was very few people participating in it. The reality is there's a lot more people participating in it than you think. Be understanding that you all, um, you will hear about some very challenging situations or behaviours. And sometimes it may be as, as things such as sexual assault and even rape you know, is quite a common. And a lot of guys will say that things have happened to them in a chemsex situation that they haven't, um, they haven't, um, you know, consented to. So we're very pro, you know, encouraging people to be able to talk about what consent is within the community at the moment. And that is, uh, is something we are as an organization on picking. Also reaffirm the sexual health messages. Just because we're talking about one issue here, we need to also be considerate that there's many other sexual health issues. So things like what was highlighted earlier on, things like continue to talk about PrEP, continue to talk about regular testing around guys who are feeling, because what's very often in respect of chemsex is that when somebody presents with a chemsex issue, um, they quite often present around that issue and that's what everyone focuses on. And if we just move on to the final slide, I think, yeah, not every gay man has chemsex. It's important to bear that in mind. And um, the thing I would really want you to do, when you lose the judgment, always do, never ask, why do you do that? Because there's lots of reasons why guys do that. And it's quite often because sometimes the sex acts involved or the reason to do it might be a personal choice as well and might actually be part of their identity. And again, just because they're having lots of sexual partners, don't shame them because they're having lots of sexual partners. And the final slide is just our website, which has got chemsex information on it. But I'll stop here. Thank you, Alison. Yeah, good to leave that. Oh, well, you'll be able to maybe see that final slide um, in later so people can can find you. So thank you very much. And again, to, to participants, just to remember and put questions from that presentation now while they're fresh in your mind, perhaps onto the question function. So next, we're going to move on. We're going to hear from Finlay Caldwell, who's um, a substance use worker and the lead on iPads for Alcohol and Drugs Action in Aberdeen. So over to you now, Finlay. Thank you. Thanks, Katrina. Um, so yeah, I'll just give a little bit of a background for myself first. So my name is Finlay Colvo and I work at Alcohol and Drugs Action in Aberdeen. So we're a third sector organisation that supports individuals in relation to their own or a family or friends alcohol and drug use. So my role within that is as a substance use worker, but I've got the lead um, in terms of working with people uh, in terms of image and performance enhancing drugs which I'll just call iPads from now on, just to speed the process up a little bit. Um, so I provide staff training within my organization, as well as increasing kind of awareness of our services within the iPad using population and working with kind of iPad users to try and reduce the harm associated with their use as well. So today I'm just um, like uh, the other two speakers, just gonna give my thoughts on the main findings kind of from the section of iPads um, from the from the research. 
So patterns of iPads used, if you can go into the next slide, sorry, Sophie. So I'll start with patterns of iPads used. So the research found that kind of there was a reasonable awareness of the recommended pattern of use regarding ster uh, steroids, which is kind of cycling the steroid use, having at least as long off the cycle as you have on cycle. There was also a reasonable awareness of the types of steroids being used, but there was less awareness when it came to additional iPads like post-cycle treatment drugs. I think um, that this just shows kind of the importance for service providers not to assume that iPad users are knowledgeable with their iPad use. Um, I find often that clients present very confident and kind of knowledgeable, but through discussion with them, you can often provide kind of important harm reduction information um, and advice that they were either just unaware of, or if they are aware of it, sometimes they're not putting it into practice and you can kind of help to encourage them to do so. So the next um, findings were adverse effects of iPad use. So the research reported a number of different physical and psychological harms associated with iPad use. I think firstly it's important to recognise that harms associated with this use can often depend on a number of different factors. So for example, what, what is the type of iPad that they're using? So is it steroids, is it human growth hormone, um, melanotan type of fat burner? And within that as well, what type of um, steroid are they using? Is it something like Trenbolone, which has been known to have more kind of significant harms associated with it than something like testosterone um, or in terms of fat burner, something like clenbuterol um, has kind of less known uh, side effects than something like DNP. So it's important to know kind of what the iPad is that someone's using, as well as that kind of how long um, have they been on cycle and what are the dosages um, that kind of of the iPad as well. Because um, we know that kind of higher dosages and longer kind of term use, uh, both associated with higher um, levels of harm um, for those individuals. Um, and for kind of uh, you also have to take in consideration the underlying health of the individual as well. Um, so, for example, someone with an underlying heart condition, um, we know that steroid use can kind of have a negative impact on blood pressure and cholesterol levels. So, obviously, this is going to potentially cause more harm to this specific user um, than kind of another iPad user. Um, so, like I say, there are numerous side effects associated with iPad use, and it's important that staff are aware of these and able to kind of pass um, these potential risks and complications on to their service users. Uh, I've found kind of um, that one of the most effective ways to reduce the harm associated with iPad use is to encourage service users to get their bloods taken and tested. So I find that this can really highlight issues that, that um, can often be kind of as a direct result of their iPad use, just in a much more striking way than someone like myself saying, um, you need to be careful that your oral um, steroid use can cause um, potential harm to your liver. Um, I often get people responding with, yeah, I know that I'm using um, live 52 or I'm taking milk thistle or I'm drinking lots of water um, and I think if you get your bloods taken and then you're able to kind of the, the practitioner is able to show um, that you know their oral use has impacted on the liver function test and it's outside the norm um, it's much more effective at getting kind of um, the individual that you're working with to either reduce their dosages or discontinue the use of that substance altogether. So I would really advise service providers to know where iPad users can go to get their bloods taken um, and discuss this as part of any engagement. So some clients um, have, have kind of informed me that they've got good relationships with their GPs and are able to get tests and support via this method. But this isn't the case for kind of the majority. And so then I would advise kind of signposting to, to the kind of free and confidential services, kind of specific services like the Glasgow and Edinburgh steroid clinics um, who are able to provide this kind of um, service. So um, we'll go to the next section, which is use of other recreational drugs and alcohol use. So the research shows that around half the participants had kind of used drugs recreationally. Um, it is quite a small sample size um, and kind of working from this the, in this area, I would say that I wouldn't really expect to see a significant increase in alcohol or recreational drug use in the iPad client group above kind of the general population, uh, mainly due to kind of the importance placed for most iPad users on diet, training, meeting their goals, whether that's aesthetic goals or kind of for sports or competition reasons. Um, and, you know, alcohol and other recreational drugs often impede with these goals. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think it's um, that much more significantly common than, than in, in the general population. Obviously, this is not always the case and it is important to be able to signpost anyone who discloses any kind of problematic um, or dependent alcohol or drug use kind of for more, more support. So the way we do it within our service, you know, if, if I was to see an iPad user in the needle exchange um, who disclosed that they were um, struggling with uh, any sort of um, drug use or uh, alcohol use, 
I would kind of um, support them to kind of go and access our drop-in service to get more additional support for that. So I'll move on to the next section, harms and consequences of iPad use. So um, the research found that some participants kind of experienced injecting injuries and disclosed some unsafe injecting practice. So things like injecting directly into smaller muscles uh, like the biceps, triceps or chest, rather than actually um, in a larger recommended site such as the glute or the quads. Um, again, I think this just highlights the importance for service providers and especially the workers in needle exchanges, um, which is by far the most common way that iPad users engage with drug services, just to have the confidence and knowledge to provide safe injecting advice um, to this client group. I'm aware that this kind of area of iPads is not always one that staff feel um, confident with, and I'll kind of discuss this at the last section today as well. Um, there was no evidence from this research of sharing needles or injecting paraphernalia, and, and this reduces the risk of BBV um, risk in this client group. Um, even so, it's just still important to discuss the risks of sharing injecting equipment and paraphernalia, as well as the kind of risks of reusing your needles um, as part of your safe injecting discussion. And again, the research didn't find a significant additional risk in relation to sexual health within this group. But again, just important to kind of briefly discuss being able to hand out condoms or signpost to sexual health clinics when required. So. Next section, information sources and needs. So the internet friends and other gym users were often the sources of information for iPad users to become informed regarding their iPad use and feedback kind of showed a desire by iPad users to be informed and get accurate information. Um, and this is definitely something I would agree with from my own experience working within the needle exchange and with this client group. So one of the best sources of unbiased kind of information that I use uh, when working with service users is the um, www.ipedinfo.co.uk site. Um, this was developed by NHS Wales and the Stero Clinic in Glasgow. And it's a great source of unbiased harm reduction information and advice, and uh, it even includes kind of a 20-minute harm reduction video, clearly going through the process of kind of safer injecting. And I've used it often with clients when they come to the needle exchange, just to show them the site, show them information on there, show them the, the kind of the video, make sure that their injecting practice is right, talk it through while watching the video. It's a really a kind of positive thing um, that you can do with, with clients. I also um, think it's just important to have kind of posters and information relating to iPads uh, and iPad use in the needle exchanges uh, just, and drug services, just to break down barriers with clients, show them that your service that wants to engage with them and support them. Um, I still feel that often iPad clients feel that services are kind of uh, for other injecting drug users and that they're just looking to get their needles and leave rather than kind of meaningfully engage um, further than that. And kind of finally, um, the service provider perspective. So um, kind of feedback from the service provider focus groups mentioned that there was a perception that iPad use was really kind of quite complex due to the chemistry and cycling nature of the drug use. And it suggested that staff kind of found it difficult to understand or feel confident within this area. It's something that I hear often, uh, both from staff that I work alongside, but also kind of at uh, previous presentations or iPad conferences that I've attended. And I do agree that there's a lot of complicated information that relates to iPad use. You know, there's new iPads can suddenly appear, there's ancillary drugs and drugs used to counteract side effects, which, you know, the way they impact in the body, you know, a bit confusing sometimes, hard to kind of feel really confident with. And um, the names are, you know, quite complex. And, and, you know, like I say, there's new drugs coming out all the time. So I, I do think it's quite, quite difficult to really feel 100% confident in kind of every aspect um, of this area. And I do believe it's kind of worthwhile just concentrating on what staff really have to know to be able to uh, kind of provide a positive, meaningful kind of harm reduction intervention. Um, and in my opinion, um, this includes kind of focusing on the iPads being used, awareness of the dosages, and accurate, safer injecting advice and provision of correct injecting equipment and paraphernalia. The awareness of the potential harms associated with the different iPad use, and that includes kind of the potential for counterfeit substances. Awareness of the pattern of use, you know, is someone, you know, cycling the steroid use or are they kind of continuous use for years? Obviously, that's going to have a difference in kind of harms associated with that. Um, as well as that kind of awareness of the terms post cycle treatment and encourage service users to research the area fully and finally to signpost to blood testing services for any other relevant services. I know it sounds quite a lot, uh, but I think it's feasible for all staff from service providers to be able to provide that. And then I think it's important that there's a dedicated member of staff within your service or a dedicated service that you're aware of that you can kind of signpost and clients onto for more in depth discussion and support. I really believe this would help staff feel more confident and engage with iPad users. Um, so that's me. It must have been 10 minutes already. So thank you. Thank you, Finley.
Yes, thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to move on to our final speaker, hopefully, um, who is uh, Dr. Alison Scott, who's a consultant in sexual health in NHS Lothian. She's also chair of the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health in Scotland, and at the moment is working on a women's health plan for Scotland. So Alison has some experience across across our groups, really. And we're hopeful that we're going to be able to hear Alison OK. So over to you, Alison. His fingers crossed. Thanks, Katrina. I hope you can hear me. Um, please wave if you go, you can. Fantastic. Yeah, um, I didn't do any slides because I thought that was going to push the technology. Um, but even without slides, we had some technical issues earlier. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate SDF on this fantastic piece of work and particularly thank Louise Bowman, who did the work in the clinic, which I set up about 14 years ago now for women who might struggle to access routine mainstream sexual health services. That involve, includes women involved in transactional sex. It also includes homeless women, women who have substance use issues or those who've been involved in criminal justice. Um, Louise came and engaged really well with women and you can see from what she's produced the sort of richness of the information that she got. And these are women who often don't trust people so she's to be congratulated on that. Emma has covered lots of areas and, and I would echo very much what her experience is of dealing with women who are involved in transactional sex and, and the problems that they have. So I'm going to try and do a little bit more of a kind of helicopter view of the whole thing. Um, as Katrina just said, I work one day a week at the moment developing a women's health plan for Scotland. And so this is really timely because one of the things being discussed there is the importance of training for staff who are not, well, there's two areas, staff who are not health staff, so that they can talk to their client group about sexual health and maybe take down some barriers to help that person get to sexual health to get a checkup. As has been mentioned already, many of the people we're dealing with and this report relates to have suffered from trauma. And so we need to be aware of how difficult it can be for that person. And on the other hand, we need to train health staff in substance misuse, if that's not an area they're already familiar with, and also in trauma. Um, I strongly believe it's no longer acceptable to say, this is us, we've got this lovely white shiny clinic, it's here from nine till seven, you're welcome to come anytime. That's, that's not good enough because lots of people, for various reasons, don't want to cross the door or can't physically cross the door or have other priorities in their life that prevent them from crossing the door. And I think we need to use work like this to look at how we take the care to the client group, wherever they may be, whether that's in a, in a sauna, a gay sauna or a sauna where there are women, or whether we take that to areas of deprivation um, so that women and men can access sexual health care far more easily. The overall approach needs to be much more a bespoke and tailored approach to sexual health care and working, as has been said before, in partnership between substance misuse, third sector, voluntary sector, to actually reach out to people as much as we can, and that will facilitate attendance. Um, what's happened over the last few years in sexual health is there's been a huge change because of PrEP, and you know that's fantastic, it's been a fantastic development, but it has meant that other services have had to shrink down. Appointments are less available because we've had to get more appointments for PrEP. That's not appropriate. We need to still be able to maintain a balance of appointments for everyone so that there's PrEP facilities, but we still have enough access for uh, other people coming for reasons other than PrEP. And and one of the things COVID has shown us is that we can deliver some of these services in other ways through remote consultations, which, as demonstrated earlier, the NHS isn't all that great at, but we are getting the technology improved. The other thing it has shown us is that not everyone has technology. Um, I think most people have been quite shocked at the number of particularly women living in areas of deprivation who don't have a smartphone, they don't have a computer, or if they do, they can't afford to pay the data for it. So again, having a flashy website with lots of information on it is great for lots of people, but it's not reaching out to everyone. 
and we need to think creatively about how we reach out to those who can't access technology or where English isn't their first language or their literacy levels are not great because they've got learning disabilities and, and we need to have appropriate ways of reaching out to them and I firmly believe that's through partnership working with other agencies who are working with these folk. We did some audit about four years ago of the clinic I work in looking at women involved in transactional sex and about more than 70% of them had substance misuse and alcohol problems. 85% uh, had some form of mental illness, ranging from anxiety and depression up to major psychosis. Gender-based violence is almost universal. It's not entirely universal, um, but when we get disclosure, it's very high rates of gender-based violence. And we need to be able to provide or signpost for support for women with that. Ironically, STI is not a huge problem. The rates of STIs in women involved in transactional sex are similar to the rates of people coming to a sexual health clinic. So that's slightly above your general population's rates of STIs, but it's not significantly higher than you would see in a sexual health clinic. So a huge part of the work we need to be doing is looking at the person holistically, dealing with their traumas and trying to help them and support them with their traumas. As Emma said, neglect, childhood abuse is really, really common amongst this group. That then leads to poor relationships, a feeling of lack of safety and security, and, and sometimes engaging in revenge sex to somehow see that as justification for what they're doing because they're getting their own back from someone who has abused them in the past. They then get stuck in this negativity. It's all about negative stuff. There's nothing positive. Um, and often it's a desire for contact and desire for closeness with another human being that can be behind many of the drivers. There's confusion between what is lust, what's sex and what's affection. And it's only through looking at that very gently and step by step through proper trauma-informed care that we can help women to look at what is a safe relationship. One of Louise's cases said that this guy gave her some crack she had the most amazing trip of her life and she thought I need to marry that man and that just kind of summed it up for me that where women view relationships and what they value in relationships can become very skewed and um, the first experience of drug use and the first experience of transactional sex I'm not sure anybody's actually looked at that properly before but that link is really strong and is really startling and and makes lots of people very uncomfortable that women are not able to consent how can they freely be choosing to do that work when they're off their face and they can't barely even remember their name we see women who are picked up on buses by cars going along the streets and in hostels these women are already vulnerable and and it's almost as if there's some kind of beacon going and, and men target these women deliberately they're then unable to negotiate safe sex and they end up re-traumatizing themselves. So I think we need a holistic trauma-informed care approach with joint working and we need staff who know how to manage complex PTSD. What's been pointed out in this report is that it may be an acute further trauma that has led to that presentation and that's on top of multiple trauma from beforehand. Hope all patients need is reliability. If a member of staff says they're going to do something, they need to do it. For many women, we see they have no reliability in their lives. They have no contact with family. They have no reliable friends. And so having a clinic which is reliable, which is always sending out consistent messages, you're valued, we care for you, we want to help you tell us what your problems are. Um, it's really important for them because that might, might be the only place in their life where they're getting that. We're not there to rescue them. We are there for the woman to tell us what her needs are and then we try and support her to find where she can have these needs met. And I say to my trainees time and time again that women are more than reproductive organs on legs. We need to focus on not just the bikini areas of women as clinicians, we need to be far more holistic in looking at all aspects of women's health. 
Um, so we can only do that if we reach out to them. And there are areas of Scotland who are saying, well, we don't see homeless people unless they come into the clinic, which you know, kind of makes me want to scream because a homeless person is not going to walk into a clinic because they're too busy trying to find a home or a secure roof or see their kids or get some food. So you, know, you need to be going out there to the places where homeless people might be and offering services and suggesting that people might uh, benefit from engaging with you. Creating meaningful relationships with them, not just lip service to that. And ensuring that if you, you're aware of Maslow's triangle of need, that baseline of Maslow's triangle is about people having food, water and shelter. And once you can have dealt with these, then you, you can look at the next layer of safety, harm reduction issues around sex work and around substance use and alcohol use as well. Um, but treating the person as a whole is, I think, really important. And hopefully with this report and, and some of the other work that's going on in Scotland, we can move forward to that. Um, my other bugbear in which SDF and I have raised concerns in the past is the care needs to be unconditional. And you can't say to women, we will provide you with this package of care, but we want you to behave in a certain way as regards contraception or any other way of behaving. Um, but we can't, that's coercion and that's a big message that we need to get out there, that we don't judge people, that we welcome them all and that we will help them in any way we can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison, for that, that overview. Um, in a moment, I'm going to ask all of the speakers to come back so that we can get ready for the question and answer session. Um, and just to say that there is also some, um, SDF are hosting some happy workshops uh, next week dedica dedicated to each of the groups. These have proved very popular, so I think um, it means that you may need to go on a waiting list if you're not already, but by all means do have a look into that um, if you are keen to, to try to join and we'll see how that, how that works out. So now, can I ask all the speakers to join the question and answer session? Thank you. I'm also going to ask Leslie, here's Leslie Bond to join us. Leslie is the National Training and Development Officer and Leslie also did some of those interviews, so some of those very good interviews um, that were done, Alison, and some of that rich data, um, Leslie uh, collected that for us. So thank you. And Leslie's been working and sorting through the questions that have been sub submitted. Um, now I'm going to be leaving in about 10 minutes time, so I'll go off screen and at that point Leslie will, will take over for, for the final um, the final kind of uh, outro if you like. So Leslie, over to you to um, give us our first question and we'll see who that should go to. Sure, so we do have quite a lot of questions that have come in and to anyone watching, keep them coming. Any unanswered questions, we'll try and get to all the speakers, even if we don't um, have them during this session, we'll get them written up and included and sent out to all attendees um, sometime next week, hopefully. So first question is actually to you, Alistair, um, about chemsex. Do you know the level of chemsex use in Scotland currently and the prevalence of chemsex in Scotland? Do we have any indication of that? Um, it's a difficult one because we, there's, lot, there's research happening, and when research happen, is happening, we're saying we're not getting lots of people coming forward to research, and it's quite challenging to reach out to people. Yet we're seeing increasing levels of, of chemsex use, particularly over the COVID-19 period, and back to that virtual chemsex environment that I talked about. Um, so I think the reported levels of chemsex are not the whole picture, and what we're starting to hear is anecdotal levels of of, of chemsex, you know, and you know, we, we operate a lot on so, social sexual apps like Grindr, for example, Squirt Recon, these kind of apps, and we see a lot more of people talking about it in these, so it makes us think that the, the levels are higher in what's being reported. So more work to be done in looking at the prevalence, I think, mm -hmm. but this report is a really good start to sort of give us a foundation for that, I think. Great, thanks, Alistair. So next up, we've got a question um, for Emma, but um, also Alison as well. Mm -hmm. Now asking more about, um, is there any outreach to, 
into sexual health services going into um, areas. Um, so for example, using vans or buses um, that you work with or your service provides? Certainly in Glasgow, um, over the COVID outbreak time, which is still going on in Glasgow and as it is all over Scotland, but certainly um, sort of at the peak of that, we had um, the opportunity to use um, the van that um, the drug crisis centre used for outreach work um, in Glasgow city centre at night. So we used that through the day to try and engage people. So a lot of homeless um, homeless people housed in hotels in the city centre at the moment. So we did some outreach work going to the hotels and actually using the van as a small mobile clinic to do some basic um, sexual health testing and BBV testing and try and um, make links let people know about our service. Um, so, so that's been really helpful. And we've also done some outreach work into some of the women's and men's hostels around the city centre um, and wider Glasgow area as well over that time. And that's continued. The van is not continuing at the moment, but certainly our outreach work is continuing at the moment. Thanks. Alison, any additionals? Yeah, I would just say that it, it's variable across Scotland. So in Lothian, and I think across the central ben, belt, outreach is, is pretty good. Um, but that's not consistently the case across the rest of Scotland. So we have a specific outreach worker who goes into hostels, saunas, um, and any social bite venues. And we also have some mobile units, but we need to have that consistently across Scotland. Thanks. And next up, we've got a question for Finlay, but maybe all um, everyone could answer. And it's, um, can you recommend any good sources of learning? You said that you gave a really good overview of um, the knowledge that lots of workers should have. So could you recommend any online sources of learning that could be a starter to better understand the iPad population? So in terms of, like, like I said before, a really good um, website is the uh, www.ipedinfo.co.uk website. Um, and that's, that's a really um, good source of information. It goes through, you know, the dr types of drugs used, um, post cycle treatment, um, the way that people cycle, um, dosages, uh, safer injecting information. It's got pretty much everything on it um, that, you, that you really want as a, as a foundation um, for knowledge anyway. Um, another thing is there's a really good poster that's kind of I think it's been created by the same the same folk, but it's got um, all the different names of the iPads on it and kind of dosages, um, information about their esters, uh, information about the different names that they might be called. So we've actually got one up in our needle exchange on the wall, um, and it just it can help staff as well. Um, you know, if someone's you know mentioned a, a substance they're not sure of, they can say, oh, "Wait a minute, um, which one do you mean?" And then that gives you a sense, so you can then look at kind of dosages and talk through. And I have quite a lot of clients who maybe look at it and then take a photo on their phone as well, and um, so that they've got that to take away with them and stuff like that. So it all just helps with engagement as well. Um, and I think clients appreciate it when they see that and they think, right, okay, that's great. You know, they're interested in, in, in the type of drug use that, that I'm engaging in. Um, and, you know, I can actually maybe start disclosing more information about potential harms or things like that. Whereas I think quite often we've found that sometimes clients can be a bit standoffish or like they almost like want to know what you know about this area before they'll then go on to engage further. So I think having that kind of information there available is really helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else for your own populations, any sources of information that you think is a good starting point for people? Uh, I'm going to plug my own website, <laughs> sx.scot, but I think the advantage of that is um, our approach to this kind of work has been very much a collaborative approach because we've engaged in, in Lovian, we've engaged with the services there, you know, the Rome team and that to help develop some of the content. And the chemsex stuff we talked about actually we worked with SDF on that and asked them for input in that. And, and I think it's it's to look out there for the collaborative kind of stuff because no website I know has 100% accuracy on every kind of situation. And it's important to link into uh, the third sector in particular, look what's about, and you know we have lots of it. And sometimes we can say things in the third sector that the statutory sector might um, struggle to get past their comms teams and things like that. So there is advantages to looking at third sector. So have a look at the third sector websites, basically what I'm saying. 
I think for um, for uh, of the three groups of people that we're talking about, the people involved in transactional sex are those that are most likely to have barriers as in no internet access and no opportunity to engage in um, health campaigns and as Alison says their, their focus is on lots and lots of other things that are much more pressing in their lives so um, I think for them as individuals there really is there needs to be a link for them to have uh, access and, and knowledge and education around sexual health and um, so I think the key is those that are supporting them to have that education and information and perhaps a starting point would be plugging, plugging Sandy for it again but there's lots of other places throughout Scotland and lots of sexual health services but um, going there to, to to look at what our service provides even as a starting point um, and there's links to lots of other support organisations there as well. Yeah, I think, you know, transactional sex is a hugely polarised argument. There are no websites talking about transactional sex, but for sexual health, um, contraception choices is a really good one. You can work through with women on what their options might be. And as Emma says, most sexual health services have their own websites explaining what facilities they provide. Um, Alison, another a question for you. Um, come in. How hopeful are you that the Women's Health Plan will be a driver for progress in the agenda around holistic trauma-informed care for vulnerable women? Well, I'm, you know, I'm a cup half full person rather than a cup half. <laughs> um, I'm really positive. What we're seeing coming out of it at the moment is really creative and looking at really different models of care. But, you know, there's this little thing called an election coming up, so it kind of depends what the final thing looks like and that's politically driven rather than clinically driven um, but hopefully this won't be the end it won't be just a one-off plan I would hope that there will then be another plan because we've only looked at specific areas for this there are lots of other areas in women's health which need to be looked at so hopefully there will then be an implementation plan and then subsequently there'll be a different plan looking at improving other areas of women's health as well thanks um, next question we have is for Alistair. Um, with regards to assault, is this normalised within chemsex? Do we see it quite a lot within the chemsex ability um, due to the lack of not being able to give consent? So how prevalent is your work with sexual assaults and working with those involved in chemsex? I love easy questions on a Friday afternoon. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, so... It's a difficult one, you know, because I think we are really only starting to have really open and concise conversations about consent at all, you know. So within within the gay community, you know, understanding so consent, even at the very basic level, is quite often problematic. And then you've got consent online about sharing of images and things like that. And then when you go on to chemsex, where by the nature of chemsex, you're going to be using substances are you able at that point to be able to give consent? So it's so complicated. And I think what we've got to start doing is have open and honest conversations with people about consent and framing what consent is to, to the populations, whether they're engaging in chemsex or not, and empower people to understand what consent means. Because at this point in time, I think that level of awareness within gay men and the wider population is, is very, very low. So I think we need to be able to start educating people about consent. I'll leave it there. Thanks. <laughs> Next question we have is for everyone. What have you seen the impact of COVID and lockdown on each of your populations been? So I'll start by saying that we actually used the opportunity to, we a lot of our routine care it had to be put on hold. Um, so we had some excess of staff that allowed us to have our team um, made a bit bigger and that allowed us to go out and do some careful outreach with the PPE and safe outreach, but it was great. It was a really good chance for us to get out and do work that we wouldn't normally have resources to do. So, but I think we're just touching on the edges of it. And I think there was there will be a big um, 
there'll be a, a fallout from it and lots of health consequences for 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 our populations, definitely. Alison? Yeah, I think sexual health took a good look at itself and uh, as they triaging and looking at who actually needs to be seen, we found that possibly only 10% of the people who were coming to sexual health actually needed to be seen and they can be managed in different ways. So that has, as Emma said, allowed us to redistribute staff and resources in different ways. Um, but I think the other thing COVID has demonstrated is the level of domestic abuse and we're now seeing lots and lots of women who've been victims of violence, uh, victims of assault during COVID, uh, and that's going to continue to come out of the woodwork for quite a long time. Thank you. And Alistair? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely like, like um, Alison's just mentioned, I get the flood sector also have had to look at how they deliver things as well. And, you know, we've moved quite considerably to doing most of that online. And that, we are conscious of that is leaving a population behind and we're looking at how we can do that. And Waverly Care had an access fund to get people to digitally engaged. Um, what we did was look at testing. We looked at how we could partnership with other organisations. We partnership with HIV Scotland and brought out HIV Self Test Scotland, which put a sort of sticky plaster over a gap in terms of provision. But what we're also seeing is very much what Alison just pointed out. We're seeing a huge increase in sexual assault, domestic abuse, or, or intimate personal uh, partner violence. And that's worrying for us because we're seeing that more condensed and we're actually seeing people engaging in, you know, coercive situations that they wouldn't normally do because they're being forced to do that, because they're being forced to stay with their partners or being forced to do a situation. So that's something we need to unpick. And a lot of people think, oh, chemsex is not happening because of COVID-19. It might be happening less, but the thing that worries me is this virtual chemsex situation. So instead of going around and meeting people, you're doing it online. So you're still getting the substance harm coming in, but you're also getting additional issues around addiction of using online platforms as well. And we're certainly seeing some, some concerns around that as well. Thanks, Alistair. And Finlay. So, uh, I mean, our service, that the, the main service that uh, iPad users engage with with ourselves is our needle exchange, and that has remained open um, throughout kind of the lockdown. Um, but numbers have dropped off, uh, understandably, in terms of people um, not wanting to come out during during COVID and um, uh, through the lockdown. We did uh, start providing a delivery service as well, where we would drop off safe injecting equipment um, for folk if they you know, weren't able to come and get it. I need to actually double check on the stats for that and how many iPad users actually took us up on that um, in comparison to other injecting drug users. Um, but what I think will be interesting is just um, potentially the impact on, on some of the clients' mental health of not just um, COVID, but also just the, the closing of the gyms and things like that, because that's... Uh, for a lot of people, the reason or part, part of the enjoyment they get is being part of that community, being in the gyms and um, talking to people about this sort of niche kind of, well, maybe not that niche um, area. Um, but but so that that kind of um, being taken away from folk had quite a big impact on some folks' mental well-being. I spoke to one guy at the start and he was really panicking about it, the gyms closing um, to the point where, you know, he was kind of feeling a bit suicidal about that impact. Now that was quite an extreme case, obviously, but it will be interesting, hopefully, post COVID, to have a look at some of that information about, you know, how people manage that situation, where people are still using iPads throughout it, but where they, where, how did they exercise? You know, how did they make sure that they were doing all the other things as well? So it will be an interesting thing to look back on. Thanks. Well, unfortunately, that's it, and we've come to the end of the webinar today. Um, it has been recorded and will be published on the SDF YouTube channel as soon as possible. And you can also view all of SDF's previous webinars there too. We do have some unanswered questions from today, so I'll send them around the panellists later on and we'll send these out next week as well. As mentioned by Katrina, next week SDF will be hosting half day workshops that will be going into more detail um, of each of the three groups based on the report that we've published today. These have proven popular and are pretty much booked out, but if you click through the link, you can add your name to the waiting list. 
we'll be able to see how many more times we um, can repeat these um, to meet everyone's needs as well. Um, the email that will come out after today's um, webinar will include a link to the full report and also links to the webinars and also a quick evaluation, which we would be really grateful if you could complete. Our next webinar is next week on Friday the 11th of September at 1 p.m. This webinar is called Drug and Alcohol Problems in Remote and Rural Scotland, Responding During COVID and Beyond. A link to register will also be included in the email to you, which you'll receive shortly. So we'd um, love you to join us again next week. And finally, I would just like to say a huge thank you to um, all of our speakers today and Katrina Matheson for chairing and our speakers, Emma Thompson, Alistair Rose, Finlay Colville and Dr. Alison Scott. It's been really interesting and informative. So thank you very much, everyone, and um, goodbye.